Thank you. Uh, I'll just start now. Um, so, first of all, some may not know, what is the shellcode? What does the shellcode look like? Well, the shellcode in itself is a little piece of uh, processor specific bytecode. So that's the bytecode, your C code, or whatever gets compiled to, directly runs on your processor. And that is actually the code that's being jumped to once an exploit has been uh, exercised against uh, some machine. So it's really the first foot the attacker gets into the door. And it's always or mostly uh, manually written by a physical processor. Ways to go there is either direct overwrite, or for example, the instruction pointer on the stack, as can be seen in the trivial 1998 uh, buffer overflow. It can be in a browser exploit, it can be sprayed on the heap, uh, and then it can be called as a function pointer uh, if there's like use of the precondition. These are all exploit specifics. I'm just going to name a few. You'll have to do some more research to get more information. Or recently, people have to bypass that execution prevention stuff to use return-oriented payloads, just short ROP payloads. Uh, usually, people are lazy and they don't write their whole payload in an ROP fashion, but they write small ROP pieces that actually allocate some room for the final shell to write code that's directly executed then again. Uh, unless you're working for what used to be dynamic and uh, Google, they do what they call rockeries, uh, where they do the whole uh, payload as a return oriented programming payload. So um, usually you can't just use the, the, the bytecode as you just would get it from an uh, assembler. Um, because hey, you're louder. <laughs> This? No. Yeah, is this loud enough now? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, where was I? Yeah, uh, so the shellcode is delivered inline because you're exploiting some application and the shellcode is being part of that exploit that gets delivered through the application payload. It might be an HTTP request, it might be whatever the application is actually processing. So sometimes it needs to be free of null bytes because the application processes C strings and a null byte will terminate the C strings that it's reading in. Sometimes you may not have uh, carriage return sequences in there because a lot of network protocols use that as a delimiter for fields and so on. So, uh, and depending on the protocol, there's other limitations. Uh, some even have strict limitations like it needs to be alphanumeric and so on. Um, of course, you cannot just encode arbitrary payload with these restrictions. So what people usually do, also for obfuscation, to get it null free, um, is that they add something like this. Instead of having one blob that is the shellcode, you have a small decoder stuff that is actually valid bytecode, and then you have the rest of the payload as an encoded shellcode. So this encoding is usually just some exclusive or something very trivial, but it's, it's, it's not trivial enough to get rid of these uh, forbidden byte values and still you can add, uh, encode arbitrary payloads. Um, the decoder stuff is just in front of, of the actual uh, shellcode payload and since uh, the memory is executed from top to down in that fashion, uh, you will just at some point run into the actual point uh, of payload once the decoder stuff has ran through. However, there's one small issue, um, at least on the x86 architecture which I'm dealing with today, you're dealing with memory operands unless you have data in the register, but in this case you need to decode some memory and to do that you need to actually know where in the memory is the shellcode since you need to reference it. So uh, you need to find that uh, location there somehow. Uh, so how does a shellcode decoder uh, stuff usually look like? Uh, I'm trying to uh, explain it very slowly here because, yeah, well, it's x 6 assembly and not everybody's familiar with. So um, we start. We start at the top. This is just a dead listing of the the shellcode decoder stuff. Uh, we start at the top, and actually, this is the decoder. So at the end of the decoder, that would be actually our payload. So we start at the top, and we need to get the location of of the payload. What we do is we jump directly to what I call get PC, which is short for get program counter or instruction pointer as a synonym. And we jump there and then uh, execute a call instruction back to the label start. Uh, the call instruction is the x86 instruction that calls a sub procedure. And sub procedures, sub procedures on the x86 architecture are implemented by simply pushing the instruction pointer on the stack and then there's the return instruction which loads the instruction pointer from the stack again once the procedure has been executed. However, we can abuse that behavior uh, if directly at the uh, start 
um, label, we pop a value from stack, in this case into the EBP register. Since the call instruction has just pushed the instruction pointer onto the stack, the next pop instruction uh, will pop the instruction pointer from the stack and will put it into the EBP register. So as a consequence, the EBP register at this place now contains the instruction pointer, and the instruction pointer is exactly the location of this payload label. So this is the, the way, in this case, we retrieve the location of the shell to the memory, and subsequently we can decode it. So we load the counter register with 42, so we're going to decode 42 bytes. We load the key, which is 23, just an arbitrary key, and then we have a simple loop that uh, will loop uh, uh, 42 times that decrypts every single byte of the shell code with an exclusive OR. Uh, and since we start, we, we, we decrypt EBP plus ECX, we will uh, first uh, so the last byte, then the second last byte, and so on, until the ECX registers zero, which gets uh, decremented every time of the loop instructions. And voila, uh, after that we will run into the jump payload instruction, which will then jump to the payload. So this is a typical old-school uh, shellcode decoder, um, like you will find it in most of proof-of-concept exploits, and this will get rid free of uh, zero bytes, as zero bytes will be 23 bytes, actually, due to the XOR in the payload. So um, these GetPC sequences are uh, mandatory to decode a shellcode on the x86 32-bit uh, architecture. The 64-bit architecture has RIP relative addressing. I'm not going to get into that, but that is not mandatory anymore. But in the 32-bit x86 architecture, we need this to actually decode our shellcode. And usually, you have to decode your shellcode. So um, what possible sequences are there? Well, first of all, as I've already explained, there's a call and then a followed by a pop primitive, which basically just uh, exploits the, the way the architecture works. So again, you push the return address of the, uh, uh, after the call instruction onto the stack, and then you use a pop instruction to get this uh, address of the instruction pointer back into a register. It's the most commonly used, most simple, most obvious way to do it. Um, there is another way, which is also generic uh, and, and uh, CPU based, uh, which is based on the floating point handling, that is in the, uh, the processor. For floating point exception handling and so on, um, there is a so called floating point control area in the FPU actually. And every time you execute a floating point instructions, like for example FNOP, which is a no operation instructions on the floating point architecture, it will save the address of this floating point instructions in this control area. So every time you can get a uh, floating point exception, you can reference, okay, where did the exception actually occur? Um, there's also an instruction which stores this uh, control area in, in a certain memory location, which is used in task switching in operating systems, so that you can keep track of the state of the floating point unit per process. Um, if you combine these uh, with another pop instruction, you can actually read the program counter as well. So you execute an FPU instruction, you use this uh, instruction floating point store environment uh, on, on some memory location, preferably on the stack, so you can directly use a pop instruction, and this combined primitive also allows you to get the uh, address of the current shellcode, or more specifically to get the address of the last executed floating point instruction, which will then be a relative address to your shellcode. And then there's some operating system specific ways to get the location of a shellcode. Um, I want to just name one uh, specific example from Windows, which is structured exception handling. Um, with recent Windows versions, there has been some mitigations for this one, but in old school Windows it was very simple. Um, on Windows, uh, the way memory access violations are handled is by, uh, called structured exception handling. These are exception handlers that are registered on the stack. So what you're going to do is to uh, register your own exception handler on the stack, then uh, generate a memory <laughs> access exception, um, so you uh, deliberately trigger an exception, and every exception handler, of course, gets also the address the exception occurred at. And again, from this address, you can uh, defer the address at the actual payload. But these are non-generic ways that are operating system specific, uh, so I'm going to focus on the first two ones that are generic for, for each processor. Um, so, there is a couple of existing approaches to detect shellcode um, in a generic fashion. Um, first of all, there are static or statistical approaches. For example, uh, Alma and Elsa 
also some Agape people I never have talked to personally actually, they presented at the Haro workshop something which is based on Markov change. So they have a Markov chain model of instruction sequences and they train these models with shellcode and non-shellcode data. And they measure basically the likelihood of um, uh, how likely is this instruction sequence to be a shellcode decoder star. Um, there's other static approaches like entropy, for example, that are similar to this. However, all these static approaches are um, flawed in, in the, in the uh, well, most obvious way that most of the actual shellcode is encoded. That's why we have these decoder stuffs. So um, since they cannot magically guess the encoding mechanism and the key, they have, can only uh, detect the actual decoder, which is a very small piece of whitecode compared to the rest of the payload. Um, that in turn means, though, that um, when you have some, things, some statistical approaches, you have either a false negative, high false negative, or high false positive rate, because you have so little data to actually match on. Um, for example, with this specific approach, with the mark of chains, um, they have to train it uh, very specifically to specific decoders, otherwise they won't, uh, would run into too many false positives. But now they're very uh, highly tied to these few training data sets, uh, and they will not even detect slight variations thereof. So all these static approaches are flawed in that they have only the possibility to detect the small decoder stuff. Um, if I just go back one slide, no two slides, um, this stuff here is well, I don't know exactly, but this is less than 20 bytes, uh, about 15 bytes, so that's not much data to match on. Um, the second approach, which has been uh, f uh, uh, followed a lot in literature, is uh, the combination of these GetPC sequence detection. That is why I introduced these GetPC sequences together um, with what they call backtracking and then emulation. So basically, uh, the way it works by is that um, they have some kind of x86 emulation and they try to detect shellcode by simply throwing everything into the simulation. So if it's actually valid code, it will execute gracefully in this uh, emulation. If it's not valid code, it will trigger some kinds of exception, like invalid instructions, it will contain invalid memory accesses, some, something like that. However, um, these emulations are usually too slow to handle all the data that you give them and execute them all in the software emulation. So um, to circumvent this problem, what they actually do is that they um, try to look for these GetPC sequences as markers of possible shellcode, and for each of these shellcode markers, they then start emulation at these markers. So these GetPC sequences need to be in any encoded shellcode, and that's what they rely on. However, the problem there is that actually um, some shellcode might initialize some register, so if you want variables to some uh, specific values, like for example, the decryption key might get actually initialized before the GetPC sequence. So um, to cover these initializations as well, they also need to include possible code that is before these GetPC sequences. Um, therefore, they need to kind of go backwards in the, in the disassembly, which is a very hard problem uh, on a CISC architecture like, uh, like the x86 uh, uh, architecture, because instructions don't have a fixed length. So instead of having uh, possible previous instructions, you get actually a tree of possible previous instructions. So that's what they call backtracking. They build up this tree of possible instructions. They have to walk this tree, see what is possible, and so on. And then they start software emulation from each of these tree nodes. So they have some overhead there as well. And in, in, in total, this is not very performant. Um, 